we'll give it a minute. Uh, my name is Sabrina Coran, and today I'm going to talk to you about human-centric AI challenges and opportunities. So before I even start, I should highlight I'm going to talk about challenges and opportunities, which means I'm not focusing on all the good stuff and how things work. I'm actually going to focus on how things are not working and where we need to invest effort. OK, so I have lots of good results from projects as well that I'd be happy to share with you later. But essentially about me, um, I'm a, an assistant professor at the University of Economics and Business. However, I am a semantic web researcher and I'm also a computer scientist, okay? So Dennis actually gave a fantastic introduction because we work in the same domain, we only met each other today, but essentially these knowledge graphs that he's talking about, some of the ones that he pointed to are in this big uh, LOD cloud here. So this is a linked open data cloud. So essentially these are all data sets and these data sets are all linked and essentially, this is the area where I'm working. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the second area, our main focus that I have is actually on constraints or policies. So when, when people uh, talk about policies, oftentimes they, they mean different things. And as soon as they see, oh, you come from the University of Economics and Business, then surely you must work on public policy and I know nothing about public policy. I, I work on machine readable policies, constraints that I want to attach to a system. So those constraints, they could be access policies. They might be privacy policies. They might be licenses that are associated with the data set. They could be regulatory requirements, things like the general data protection regulation and how do we comply with that and so on and so forth. And essentially what I work on is not only the formal representation of those policies, but also how do we enforce those policies? How, how do we ensure a system is complying with the policies, the rules of the system? And I apply these, uh, these works in different use cases. So sometimes it has to do with uh, multi-agent systems. Other times it has to do with cyber physical systems. Uh, I teach data science, so I teach big data legal and ethical. So on the one side, I'm, I'm going through some machine learning algorithms, uh, applying them on big data infrastructure and showing the students how they can use them. But then I'm saying to them, OK, but you have to also consider that there are legal and ethical challenges that you will have to deal with. So essentially, this is me. This is my background and, and this is the perspective that I have. And essentially, it all started with Tim Berners-Lee. So Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web, essentially, originally, his, his vision was that we would be able to connect all of these documents. And then a couple of years later, he said, you know what, this could be a really excellent source of data. And we could have intelligent agents, and those agents would be able to work on our behalf. And I don't know about you guys, but really and truly, there's just way too much data out there. And when I want to book a trip or when I want to find information about a research area or, or when I want to just uh, find information about a new city, there's too much there. there. There's information overload. So what I'd really like is I'd, I'd like an agent, an intelligent agent to work on my behalf. So this was the vision of Tim Berners-Lee. Now, essentially, what we do have is we have the web. 30 years later, and the web is, you, you know, it's everywhere. It's indispensable. We need it for everything. We have all of these rich data sources, but we don't have our intelligent agents. And, and why don't we have our intelligent agents? Because the, the web turned out to be much as he expected, other than the legal and ethical issues he's currently talking about. But essentially, why, why don't we have these uh, intelligent agents? And I would argue that we don't have them because of the fact that we didn't put enough emphasis on the policies, the constraints of the system. That agent needs to be able to actually know what licenses are associated with the data set. It needs to know what are are my privacy preferences. It needs to know the regulatory constraints or the privacy issues in terms of the GDPR. It needs to know about social norms. So essentially, my agent, when I'm in Japan, needs to behave in a different way than my agent would when we're here in Europe. 
So essentially, we're missing something when it comes to these intelligent agents. And you've already guessed, I'm sure, that I come from the symbolic side of AI and I'm, I'm not a machine learning person. But today I wanted to kind of show you how my work also translates into machine learning. So essentially, I worked on a project called Dalek, and Dalek was about licensing. So I, d I don't know about you guys, but usually when I uh, go searching for something, I now actually check the license because I had a licensing project. So I know that I have to check the license of each and every resource that I'm going to use. And I give lots of presentations, and therefore I need images. But when I actually change the search to include the license restriction, I get very, very poor results back. So therefore, I cannot use all of these rich materials that are available on the web. The same goes for data sets. The same goes for code. We have all of this public data, but in fact, in many, many countries, it's all rights reserved because people are actually not putting a license on the data. So as a data scientist, all of this rich data is available, but from a legal perspective, it may actually not be legal for you to crawl all of that data, analyze that data and develop those algorithms on top of it. So what we were looking to do was we were looking to represent the license in a machine readable fashion such that when you actually have a crawler, the crawler can actually go and pull back the data set, can pull back the license and also can actually check if these licenses are compatible. Because I'm not a lawyer, I don't know if, if two licenses are compatible or not. I would have to seek le legal assistance. And that's just what we did in the project. We worked with lawyers in order to actually figure out how do we represent these policies so that we could actually reason over it automatically. And then it came to, okay, the special project. And special is a Horizon 2020 project, which is looking at how do we help companies to comply with the general data protection regulation. Special finished in December this year, but essentially what we were looking at again was policies, but this time it was usage constraints. How do we represent consent in a machine readable fashion? And how do we represent the processing that's actually happening within the organization in a machine readable fashion? And how do we represent the GDPR or part of it in a machine readable manner such that we can reason over all of those things such that a company who wants to do data science, who wants to develop innovative solutions can actually do so knowing that they're complying with the usage policies, knowing that they're complying with the general data protection regulation. This particular model, which I show you here, is based on a standard. So the standard is the Open Digital Rights Language, which is a W3C standard. But actually, it was designed for licensing. So we used it in the first project. But you know, when it came to usage policies and when it came to regulatory constraints, we needed something a little bit different. So what we did was we created a profile which was more fitting to our needs. What's really positive about this is that it's based on a standard and there are many, many companies that are already adopting it. And that's what we need. We need standards when it comes to these policies and the representation of policies. And what we can do is we can actually represent a business process as a set of permissions that the business was, would like to execute. And then we can automatically check it against the GDPR. And we can actually use logging mechanisms internally within an organization to compare to the usage policy. But going more towards the AI and the machine learning side of things. So Gary Richardson, he said, you know, perhaps we're actually reaching the third AI winter. Essentially, many companies cannot use the machine learning algorithms. Why can't they use these algorithms? Well, essentially, you know, they have to be accountable. So let's say it's a financial services domain. Let's say it's a healthcare domain. You know, can, when the system says yes or the system says no, can you actually explain why the system gave that answer? And this is why there is a huge call for explainability at the moment. And there's major concerns from a human perspective in terms of the biases that could be built into these algorithms. It's not just the algorithms, it's the data, it's the algorithms, it's the process, it's the interpretation. So we need policy on a more general level in order to cater for these challenges. And essentially, there is work in this space. So I, I went looking and I said, you know, I, I'd like to be able to explain these algorithms to my students. I would like to be able to, to give them some confidence because coming from, you know, a rules area, 
it's, it's essentially if then else statements and I can explain it quite easily. But these machine learning algorithms, especially deep learning, it's not so easy to explain them. But DARPA have been trying, and essentially this is a slide taken from one of their slide decks, which is quite nice because it shows three different uh, approaches to explainability. So the first one is deep explainability. And this is where you combine symbolic and sub-symbolic AI because uh, what you actually have there is a neural network and that neural network has labels associated with it. So just think of the labels that Dennis was talking about. Think, think of actually having that knowledge graph with all that vocabulary, which is in numerous languages. And think of being able to feed that rich, rich data source into your machine learning algorithm in order to actually provide some explainability with respect to the decision that was made. The second one is interpretable models, and this is much closer to the if-else statements you'd be familiar with if you've done any sort of coding. And the third one is in, uh, the model induction, and essentially it's poking and prodding at the box. If I, if I change, you know, if I'm looking for a loan and I say Sabrina earns 40,000, no, I don't get the loan. Sabrina earns 50,000, no, I don't get the loan. Sabrina earns 60,000, yes, you can have the loan. And then you, you know, based on the input parameters and the output parameters, you can actually come up with some explanation as to, to why uh, the, the system responded yes or no. It's, it's obviously not so um, simplistic in a real life scenario, but essentially there's, there is some research in this area, but there's a need for much, much more. And I'd like to, to talk to you just about a couple of projects that have recently started and are going in this direction. So the first one is a Marie Curie training network. It's called NoGraphs, Knowledge Graphs at Scale. And essentially we are training 15 PhDs who are going to be working on knowledge graphs, machine learning, natural language processing, constraints, legal aspects of knowledge graphs. It's a multidisciplinary project and explainability, biases, responsibility are all part of our research agenda there. In terms of um, my own work, uh, I will start on the 1st of March, a new FWF project, which is uh, an Elisa Richter. It's core fundamental research, and it's going back to my original uh, story where I want those intelligent agents. And I have work on how to represent licenses. I've worked on how to represent usage policies. I have a deep background in access control. I can also represent regulatory constraints. But how do I bring all of those together to push this a little bit further so that we have those intelligent agents that can work on our behalf across distributed data sets throughout the internet and can take all of these constraints into consideration? And how can we ensure that the system is explainable, that I as a human being can actually understand how that system is using my data? Um, and the third one is, is not yet a project, hopefully it will be a project at some stage, but it's also on constraints and therefore I thought it was relevant and I wanted to mention it today. And essentially the idea here is that blockchain could be the next ICT infrastructure of the future. And I was really interested in, in blockchain in the context of our special project because I thought, Okay, so we need to prove that a company is complying with the consent of the data subject. Well, great, I can store it in a blockchain and then I can basically make sure that that stays there forever because it's immutable and that makes it an excellent source for me. But then I started to think about the problem and I realized, oh, it's immutable and there's the right to be forgotten in terms of the GDPR and, and how do these two things fit together? And then I started to think as well, well, you know, those company systems, they're going to stay there. Those line of business applications have been there for quite some time. And essentially, if a company wanted to, they could lie or they could basically amend the truth or, or kind of bend the truth slightly. So what was the point of having this rock solid ledger if what was in it could potentially be nonsense? So I started looking at blockchain and saying, okay, well, we have smart contracts, we have chain code. I'm more into Hyperledger than Ethereum because Hyperledger has excellent support for industry. And essentially I was looking at uh, this area and I was saying, okay, so we have these uh, smart contracts or chain code. 
maybe I could do all of my policy enforcement and compliance checking there. And the use case that we have is a, a data market. So essentially, it would be an autonomous data market. The data would come with some usage policies. Then you would have a buyer. The buyer would have some preferences. There may be some privacy considerations. And the, the smart contract or chain code needs to be able to interact and needs to be able to negotiate on behalf of both the buyer and the seller. Um, and essentially, the main issue that I had was how do I trust that infrastructure? You know, once I deploy my smart contract slash chain code, how do I know that my autonomous data market is behaving correctly? How do I know essentially that, that it's, someone is not trying to cheat the system? So essentially what we need, we don't need just the policies, but we also need the, the transparency mechanisms, the enforcement mechanisms, the compliance mechanisms. And what's particularly neat about this project is that we're teaming up from different domains. So it would be me with the policy background. Claudio actually comes from a BPM, business uh, process management background. And he's used to doing the monitoring and compliance in terms of policies in a BPM context. And then Ruben comes with a decentralization background and an engineering background. And essentially all these three different domains could come together to, you know, in order to provide some enforcement mechanisms. So in summary, the challenges as I see them for human-centric AI, I think we're far away away from actually having these machine-readable policies. I think it's going to take quite some time until we actually have the, the representation of all these different types of policies that are able to coexist and form part of one bigger system. Uh, the multi-agent systems uh, community are very much looking into this problem at the moment as well. I think that there are major cognitive limitations in terms of us as humans. We found that in special where we basically were trying to get consent from the data subject uh, with respect to the processing of their personal data. And the first UI, it was a graph. We thought, oh, this is great. We can traverse the graph and I'll understand exactly what's happening with my data. And we did a user study and essentially they were confused, it was annoying, and, and they used a lot of negative terms when they assessed the UI. So we went back and we, we changed the design and we just had you know, the functionality and you could either, you wanted the functionality or you didn't. And essentially you always have this functionality privacy trade-off. And essentially you just dragged it and the graph was in the middle. Annoying, confusing, difficult. So we thought, well, what's wrong with our interfaces? So we came up with a, a, a new example, and this time it was a slider. And it went from you know, your utility uh, with, with maximum privacy at the start and maximum utility at the bottom of the slider. And essentially all they had to do was to slide it and look and see what data was being given over and they could look at the graph. They liked it. Why did they like it? Because it was exactly the same as one tick. And that's what we all really want. We want the privacy, of course we want the privacy, but we want to make it really, really easy for us that we just click one button. And then when it came to our dashboards, which again, we had lots of iterations of our dashboards, and what we wanted to see was for one use case scenario, what sort of processing was being performed and did it actually adhere to the consent? And again, it was really, really difficult to digest. And imagine, you know, that was a very simple system. Imagine if it was a complex system. Imagine if it was a multi-agent system and somebody actually had to analyze all of that. So in terms of cognitive limitations, there are major issues. Um, standardization is difficult. We need standards because if we don't actually work together in terms of standardization, uh, we, we will not uh, achieve our vision anytime soon. And essentially ex trying to test that the system is actually complying, whether it's actually just a line of business application uh, or whether it's a machine learning algorithm, how, how can we be sure that that system is complying? And if you actually have to do auditing and governance like you have to do in terms of the general data protection regulation, where we have the data protection authorities that are, are looking to enforce it, if you have to do this and all the processing happens within, within the company, how do 
do we ensure the compliance? How, how, how can we have those guarantees? How do we as humans, as, as data subjects, as real people, how do we have the guarantees that our data is being used in the way, in the manner that we actually want it to be used? I really like uh, the, the work on uh, synthesized data. We have a project on that as well. But I worry, I worry that this synthesized data will be used for bad. When I uh, queried, uh, we were at a, a, a conference where all, a few of our um, H2020 projects came together and it was a privacy conference and it was more focusing on ethics and data science and AI. And essentially somebody presented and we polled the room to find out, okay, what do you think of this synthesized data? And essentially the result of it was, if it's for healthcare, yes, we love it. It's really, really good. However, if it's actually for a company to make money, mm, we're not sure whether we like that technology or not. So, so it's, it's a new technology. It has a lot of potential. I'm very interested in it. Uh, but again, you know, how do we know it complies with constraints? And then finally, we need to, you know, embrace the fact that data is distributed and decentralized. We don't have everything in one place. We don't have one set of rules that actually governs it, which makes it much, much more complicated to do all of the above. So thank you very much.